So why did you come out this morning? Why not just stay home? Go to the lake. Mushrooms are growing. You could have went mushroom hunting. What made you come here today? Over the last week, I've been asking myself the question, why do I do what I do? Why do I get up in the morning? Why do I come to church, and why do I read my Bible? Why do I study? Why do I meet with people and talk with people? Why do I visit people in the hospital or in their homes? Why do I exercise? Why do I do what I do? And my desire is to honor God, and I hope that we're here today to honor God. We're we're doing this series right now from the book of Philippians, and it's titled, um, stepping up series. It's, it's a call to each of us to take our faith to the next step, wherever we're at, to go to the next step. And today, I've titled the sermon, The Greatest Compliment is Imitation. When I was a kid, growing up in, in rural Iowa, I remember that whenever it was time for a new school year, one of the things that we had to do was get some new tennis shoes. And, and in my day, the tennis shoe of the time was either white or black canvas converse. How many of you remember those shoes? Ah, yeah, a lot of people. It's like, it's like they were the coolest thing ever, right? You had these flat black shoes or white shoes, and they had this, this symbol on the side right there where your, where your ankle bone is. Right there was the knob that said Converse, all-star. It was awesome. We really thought we were cool, right? Then I got a little bit older, and, and as I grew older, th- there, there came this guy along that was really, really popular. They called him Mike. You might have remembered him. You, you probably heard about him. And, and they, he became this great basketball player, you know, Michael Jordan. And, and everybody wanted to be like Mike. In fact, that was part of the advertisements, be like Mike. And, and they developed this shoe from Nike that was like the Michael Jordan shoe. And so I remember when I was a teenager, we would go to, to Iowa City to the, to the big old hall there on the University of Iowa campus, and we'd get into these pickup basketball games, you know. And you'd see these guys around there. There'd be like these teams. We'd be up there, you know, a bunch of farm boys. We'd go up there to bang around with the dudes from the big city. And, and some of these big city guys would come in, and they'd have on these, like, real expensive Michael Jordan, your, your airness, you know, Air Jordan shoes on. The shoes that were like a like hundred bucks. And back in that day, that was a lot of money, you know. And, and they'd put these shoes on, and it's going to like make them a superstar basketball player, right? They'd like put these shoes on, and they'd be out there in the court, and you, you know, moving around, and, and they were all ready. And, and, you know, some of them guys, you just know they thought they were going to dunk, and they were going to be doing all this fancy stuff because they had the shoes on, right? And I remember standing on the sidelines this one game, and this team had like all these guys on these real expensive Air Jordan shoes. I'm standing there watching them. I'm like, dude, he can't even jump. I mean, you're not dunking, buddy. Just because you got the shoe on doesn't mean you can dunk. And, and then the Nike came out with these commercials like, just do it. You deserve it. And they had all these commercials centered around that. And even today, you can still buy a pair of Air Jordan shoes. And I think I saw this last week when I was at the shoe store with my son. You can buy some Air Jordans for like 250 bucks. Am I right? 245 Does anybody know? Is that right? Did I see it right? Yeah, somewhere around there. It's like, that's crazy stuff. Dude, I'm thinking 250 bucks, that's like a whole bunch of steak and charcoal and a great big grill party. It sounds really good to me. But the reason people do this stuff is because they want to imitate and be like Mike. People always pick these superstars. So like yesterday was like the end of the big week, right? We had the end of the NFL draft. We had prom. We had the big fight of the ever last night, you know, and we have all these people. I mean, nobody's worth $200 million to pound on someone else's head. That's just ridiculous. Sorry, that's just my opinion. The reality is, though, is because of these figures, we have all these people that spend buco bucks to try and be like them. And today, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture from Philippians chapter 2, and, and Paul is telling us 
There is a reason to imitate somebody, and there is a person to imitate. That's Jesus Christ. And I hope today the reason we are truly here is not because it's the right thing to do for our community, that it looks good if we go to church and everybody sees us, but we're here because we want to become more like Christ. And we want to take our faith to the next level. And we want to make sure that when we leave here today that we know when we left that we have spent some quality time worshiping someone that deserves our worship. Michael Jordan doesn't deserve our worship. If you're a big fan of Michael Jordan, he was a great basketball player. He doesn't deserve your worship. And, and there's not an athlete that deserves our worship. And Paul describes in this passage who deserves our worship and how we can become like them. We can be imitators. If you have your Bibles, if you will turn to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to start reading with verse 1, and we're going to look at the first 11 verses today. And how do we as a church become more like Christ? How do we step up our faith and go to the next level? Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with His Spirit... If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why are you here? Paul says, we do what we do to the glory of God the Father. That's our purpose. That's our reason. And that's why we live that way. And so this morning we're going to look at these ways that we as a church, we as a people can become more like Christ, that we can imitate Christ. The first thing that we're going to see in this passage of Scripture that Paul is writing to us is he's describing that we are called to unity. Paul is giving us these four exhortations at the start of this passage, and he's calling the Philippians to unity really at two levels when he uses these exhortations. And let's look at them again. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if you have any fellowship with his spirit, any, if any tenderness or compassion... Now, now that, that, that last phrase, any tenderness and compassion, he's described in the Greek it says, if you have anything that goes to the pit of your bowels, which was the very core of your being, if you have any of those components together, then Paul says, make my joy complete, complete by being like-minded, by being of the same love, by being one in spirit and in purpose. He's, he's reminding them of the love and the care that they are to have for each other. And he says, all of these reasons for doing this is if you like me. So the two reasons that he gives us, first of all, is on a human level. Paul says, listen, have I shown you any love? Have I shown you any affection? Have I been a role model to you in any way? Have I given you a reason to live out your faith? And, and he describes all of that from the connection. And he says, folks, we ought to have unity with each other and with God because of that connection. There's a human connection. And, and Paul says, can I appeal to you on the human connection that you might be able to be unified together? And then he goes on and he says, but if that's not enough to have a unity because of the human connection, you know, because, because we like things together and we do things together, because then let me explain it to you more clearly, and that is we need to have unity because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has to be the core of everything Paul is saying. 
So he says, we need to be unified in spirit. And he's not just talking about spirit between each other, but he's also talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, we need to be unified because of the Holy Spirit. And he begins to describe how unity looks as we're unified together in the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about that. You see, he says, we got to have a unity that is centered around the Word of God. In Psalms 119, verse 11, the psalmist says it like this. It says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not, that I might not sin. It's God's word that helps us understand what sin is. It's not our culture. Our culture does not depict to us what sin is. In fact, if you look to our culture for moral values today, you're in trouble. I'm warning you right now, close your eyes, plug your ears and go, la, 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 because it won't work. Our culture takes us in places we don't want to go. And so we start and center our unity around the Word of God that we can know and understand what God calls us to so we know what sin is and we know how to overcome sin. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So I can come and be an overcomer of that. You see, Paul is reminding them that unity is essential for the spiritual growth of the church and to progress the gospel and to live in victory over our adversity. We all have adversities, we all have difficulties, and we've got to be centered, we've got to be unified, and it starts with unity around the Word of God. It's also a unity that is centered around Christ. If it's not centered around Christ, we have a problem. You can center it around an athlete, but athletes make lots of mistakes. Humans make lots of mistakes. Listen as I read from 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says it like this in chapter 3. If you want to turn to it, you can. If you just want to follow along and listen, that's okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm going to start reading with verse 10. Paul says it like this. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. So he's talking to the people there in Corinth, and he's telling them in Corinth, he says, guys, I've laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it, and that foundation I laid was sowing seeds of righteousness. I was teaching people about Christ. He goes on, he says, but each one should be careful how he builds. And then he says this, and this is, this is one of the most powerful verses of all Scripture. Verse 11. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If a man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward, but if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames." And he's describing here in this passage that the foundation we are called to build on is Jesus Christ. And so when you go back to Philippians 2, when Paul says, be of one spirit and be together, he's describing a unity that's centered not only around the Word of God that helps us know what sin is and how to overcome sin, but he says, more importantly, it's got to be centered on the foundation that was laid in Jesus Christ. Now, now, Paul is not looking for uniformity of opinion. He's not saying, look, we've got to all agree. So in other words, if I said to you, what's the perfect breakfast? I would say to you, well, a couple eggs, really crisp bacon, hash browns that are fried very crisp, then a little cheese on top of the hash browns, and then brown gravy on top of that. And some of you are going... I, Oh, yeah, that sounds really good. You know? Then there's others you're going, oh, that's way too much. I mean, you should have one little cup of oatmeal with raisins. And I would go, you know? Now, who's right? Everybody. Right? Uniformity of opinion says we all have got to agree on some of those things. Paul's not saying that. He says we have to have unity of soul. 
we can disagree about the right meal to eat. We can disagree about whether it's better to drink Pepsi or Diet Pepsi or Coke or Diet Coke or heaven forbid you drink some monster energy drink or some other energy drink, but you drink water, you know, that'd be the best. He says, that's not it. But he says, I want you to have and possess a common soul and, 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 and share a common affection. A common desire to live in harmony that is centered around Christ. He's reminding the people in Philippians, he says, move away from that party spirit that is so evident as a part of the Philippian culture and begin to focus on Christ. Move away from that party spirit that is focused on, on empty conceit and self-interest, which happens when we consider ourselves better than everybody else around us. Man, I'm so, much, I'm, I'm so glad I'm better than everybody else. Like the Pharisee that stood in the temple and said, oh Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like the tax collector that does all these ungodly things that people takes everything away from them. I'm glad I am a Pharisee. Dude, that's not biblical at all. Unity is talking about being one in that spirit. And the second thing that Paul is describing here in this first part is he begins to talk about the humility and how we function. One of the most gag things for me in the last 10 days is listening to all this talk from all these athletes of how great I am. I don't know how that strikes you, but I just like, oh, nobody's worth that much money, nobody's that great, right? There's no humility lost in most of these attitudes. And what Paul is talking about here is he says, guys, begin to focus on why are you doing what you're doing? And, and he's talking to the Philippian church here, and he's talking with them because their focus was on me. They, they did the i stuff long before there was iPods and iPhones and iMessaging and all the i stuff. They actually invented it, and then it was uh, commercialized in, in the 20-somethings, you know, 2010s or 2000-something. But, but they were all filled with this self-conceit and doing things my way, and everything was about themselves. They were different than the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, their focus was on who has the greatest spiritual gift. If I speak in tongues, ha, huh, I'm much more of a, of a godly person than, than this guy over here, because this person over here has the gift of, of prophecy. Well, my, my speaking in tongues is better than prophecy. And the, and the Corinthian church was battling with all this stuff around which gifts or which spiritual gifts are the best. In the, in the Philippian church, theirs was all about self-centeredness and all their, ah, oh, it's all about me, the I stuff. And Paul says, no, it's in humility. He says, we need, to, we need to not look out so much for ourselves, but we need to look out for others. He says, when we look out for me, it's in a contrast to the God that we say that we serve. So when you see these people that go off on this me stuff, and then they say, I'm a born-again believer, I say to myself, Hmm, one plus one is not equaling two here. We have a problem. Listen as I read from 1 John chapter 4. We spent some time in 1 John, and so some of you know exactly where it's at in your Bible. It's, it's got the where pages there. And in 1 John chapter 4, John says this. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Paul says, we need to have humility and look out for the best of those around us. Christ came that each one of us might be able to have the best of everything. And he offers that gift to everyone. And we'll see that just a little bit further as we look at this passage. So in these exhortations that Paul gives us at the beginning of this passage, verses 1 to 5, he's describing how we work at unity and how we work at humility. And he says this, he says, unity cannot coexist with individualism. Unity of the Spirit and unity in the bonds of faith cannot coexist when I'm working on me, I what I want, and how I can do it for myself. 
It means we begin to look out for the interests of those around us. And, and we're going to see how we do that when we look at these next verses, starting with chapter uh, 2, verse 5 to 11. It says this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above all names, that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul says, for us to be a church that emulates Christ, that imitates Christ in our life. We do not only have unity and humility, but there has to be honor. There has to be honor. And the honor comes in three ways that we see Christ modeling. Now, you can break it down in a variety of ways, but I've, I broke it down for us this morning in three ways that Christ models to us how we have this honor that God gives us. And the first one is this, is that we have to be willing to live in self-surrender. Jesus willingly submitted to God, his Father. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He had everything before the incarnation, before he came as a human being. He was co living with God in heaven. He was a co-creator. It says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. It's describing Christ. And he was willing to give that all up. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, remember what he said? As he was there, he says, Lord, if it's your will, you could take this away from me. But not my will, yours be done. That's self-surrender. It's not self-sacrificing, that's self-surrender. He's saying, God, I want to move beyond myself. And Paul is reminding the Philippian people, he says, folks, you've got to move beyond your self-fulfilling ways of living and begin to move towards a model that Christ gave us, surrendering to God. Surrender is not something that comes natural, and it's not something that our culture teaches us to do. Marriages are ending at a very rapid rate in our culture today. You know why? Nobody wants to live out Ephesians 5. You know what Ephesians 5 says? It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then it goes on to describe wives submitting to their husbands and husbands loving their wives as Christ of the church. And it's describing the self-surrender aspect of living. It says, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's about God. Coming here to worship this morning is about saying, wow, God, you have done so much for me. You have given me everything, and I want you just to set my heart on fire. I'm here for you. It's not about what I like or don't like. It's not about having eggs and bacon and crisp potatoes with gravy and cheese. No, it's about feeding on the Word of God and being focused on Him. Self-surrender says, God, not my will, but yours be done. It's when I go to pray, it's not me trying to line up God with me, but it's trying to line me up with God. That's self-surrender. Allowing God to be in charge. The second part of that is that Christ teaches us in this passage is it's a self-renunciation. So, so as I said, before the incarnation, Christ and God and the Holy Spirit were together doing creation. Hey, let's make some dry land down there. Okay, let there be land. There was land. Let's make some sunlight. Oh, let there be light. And there was light. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Ha, huh, let's have some stars so they can know where they're going. They don't even need a compass. We got stars. We got, we got animals. We got people. We got all this stuff. He was there at the beginning. And we often miss that the nature of God is that it means to give up self-advancement and self-interest to willingly give everything for the enrichment of everybody. So God did that in the beginning of creation, and he gave that to us when Christ came. Christ said, why would I leave heaven? I got everything. Why would I do that? And you know what he said? He said, I was worth it. He said, you were worth it. And he renounced it all, and he walked away. 
And it says in this passage that being in nature God, he gave it up and came as a servant. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He gave it all up for you and I. That we can make good choices, that we can make wise choices, that we can model life that reflects Him. When people see us, do they see Christ or do they see a crazy person that's doing their own thing? And God says, when people see you, they should see Christ in us. In coming as a person, as an incarnation, God desires God desired to grow all people to become more like him and to act more like him. That's what he wants. He wants to go to the next level. Allow him to guide us and lead us and direct us. Self-renunciation. And the, and the last part that we see that Christ talks about is self-sacrifice. Christ literally gave his life for you and me. He gave it up. And, and even hanging there on the cross, as painful as that was, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When you go back to the first part of this passage, when Paul says in these four exhortations, when he says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, if you've had tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. If you are united with Christ, then make my joy complete. If you have any comfort from his love, then make my joy complete. If any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness, and he's describing this relationship that goes to the very core of our being. And Christ said, my love for each person here was so great to the very core of my being. I'm willing to give it all up to grow and enrich people's lives to become more like what God wants us to be. He gave up all his rights as God, as co-creator, as one with his Father, so that you and I could be united with Christ. This is the way Peter described it in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, Peter describes it this way, and he says that in God's economy... Peter is saying, listen, in God's way of looking at life, it's by giving that we really receive. It's by serving that we are served. It's by losing our life that we find it. It's by dying that we live. It's by humbling ourselves that we are exalted. And it's always in that order. Always. Self-sacrifice before one's exalted. If you're not willing to self-sacrifice, you can't experience the exaltation of God. And this is the way Peter describes it in, in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, Peter has preached this powerful sermon. And he's described in this sermon what it means to be like in a relationship. And at the beginning of his sermon, the people thought that Peter was drunk. They said, what's wrong with this dude? He's preaching. Everybody can understand it. It's, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. It's too early to be drinking. What's wrong with him? And then Peter goes on, and thousands come to know God that day. They come to know Jesus Christ because of this sermon. And this is what Peter says. He says, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Now here's the important part of that. When he's describing him as Lord, he says, we're putting his as number one in our life. And that happens, he says, that happens because he's our Christ. To make him Lord, we've got to submit to him, and that comes to repentance and forgiveness. That means he's our Christ. And so they go hand in hand. He's our Lord, and he's our Christ. You can't have one without the other, and they happen simultaneous. And then Paul, Peter goes on, and he says this in his sermon. He says, they said, so people said, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And this is what Peter says. It's really awesome. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord your God will call. And Peter is describing that when we empty ourselves and allow God to be Lord of our life, everything changes. 
So I challenge you this morning. Take another step. Don't be content to stay where you're at. God didn't put you on a perch to stay there. But he's got you on a hill leading to the cross. And that hill is go another step. Get closer. Get more involved. Get more fired up. The faith that changed you is the faith that can change those around you. Believe it. It's true. I know. I've experienced it, and I know that God is doing that same thing to those around us. God says, imitate me. And that model was Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for today. And thank you, God, for your love and care for us. I pray, God, that you will just help us to release our heart to yours and allow you to be in control of us. God, as we leave here today, I pray that you will be in full control of us and we will be in full surrender to you, that you can be exalted in our life and we can exalt you wherever we go. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.